This book right here says Benedict Arnold, a traitor in our midst by Barry Wilson. It says here in those early New Haven days, according to one biographer, Arnold had a strong physical appearance with a distinctive nose, a high forehead, suggesting intelligence, a prominent chin and great piercing eyes. Elsewhere, he was he has been as short, swarthy and hard muscled. According to the Encyclopedia of the American Revolution, he was five foot nine inches. So he's not that short, tall, with gray eyes, set of by black hair and a swarthy complexion. Who's saying that? The Encyclopedia of American Revolution saying that he has a swarthy complexion. Benedict Arnold, 1740, senior officer of the British Army who commanded the American Legion in the later part of the Revolutionary War. He is best known for his defection from the Continental Army to the British side of the conflict in 1780. So a traitor, right? They'll call him a traitor. These were spies, really. They were swarthy spies. An encyclopedia of American Revolution describing him as swarthy. Does this look like a swarthy person to you? Nah. Nah, this is not swarthy. He got rosy cheeks. They're trying to make swarthy into a whole different thing here. Now the body snatcher, ladies and gentlemen. American heritage. Benedict Arnold, the aftermath of treason. What are they saying here? It says, from an open carriage bearing him up Walnut Street, he acknowledged the cheers of the crowd with blunt nods of his big head. He had a big head, though. He kept saying it, right? His twice-wounded left leg resting on a pillow. His blue eyes, right? Blue eyes, startling a pale, startling a pale, and a swarthy, a swarthy, trusting, truculent, handsome face. In the American heritage. Trusted writing on trusted writing on history. Travel, food, and cuisine. They, you got to trust them. Swarty. And then this is uh, the legends of the American Revolution, 1776, or Washington and his. And then says George Lippert. This is a, an older book, a more primary source. All right. What is it saying about Benedict Arnold? It says that they tell me that his features, swarthy and battle-worn, lost every trace of vivacity. They were riggedly fixed, the lips compressed, the bow calm and unthrown and wore an expression that no one could read. While his eyes had a wildness in their gleam, a fire in their glance and told somewhat of the supernatural struggle of work within him, the battle between Arnold's revenge and Arnold's pride. All right, Arnold, the swarthy guy. This is from Claremont Review of Books. The regulars are coming. It says Rick Atkinson's Revolutionary War trilogy looks fair to become the standard account of the war that brought the American Republic into being by Andrew Roberts. All right. It says, similarly, Atkinson depicts Benedict Arnold as a muscular and graceful with black hair, a swarthy complexion, swarthy complexion, and that long beaky nose. He was adept at fencing, boxing, sailing, shooting, riding, and ice skating and was a fine captain as America would produce that century, a man born to lead other men in dark of night. All right, so again, another source telling us he's swarthy, Benedict Arnold. Now it says here, the book is Life of Abraham Lincoln, being a biography of his life from his birth to his assassination, also a record of his ancestors, and a collection of anecdotes attributed to Lincoln. He is the gentlest memory of our nation. That um, right here is the Abraham Lincoln's autobiography. Now it says here, the following autobiography was written by Mr. Lincoln's own hand. Now he says right here again, and it's in this book too, it says, if any person, personal, if any personal description of me is thought desirable, it may be said, I am in height, six feet, four inches, nearly lean in flesh, weighing on average 180 pounds, dark complexion. He's saying himself, dark complexion, dark complexion. What are you gonna say? Hey, curimero, that means pale. Also, dark means pale too. Dark complexion is dark complexion. I don't care what anybody says. They wanna show us white images of Abraham Lincoln. They wanna say, oh no, he just meant he was a little dark because he's Semitic or, or because he might be a little mixed or because he's, he's, he's <laughs> whatever they wanna try to say, dark complexion is dark complexion. It's not pale, right? With coarse, coarse black hair coarse black hair dark complexion that's himself describing himself as that all right all right now we're going to this book all right we're going to go into her mom another source it says the story life of lincoln a biography composed of 500 true stories told by abraham lincoln and his friends again true stories 
selected from all authentic sources and fitted together in order forming his complete life history by Wayne Whipple. I'm on page 273 of the same book. And down here it says, almost from his opening words, the speaker assumed an air of superiority, stating his facts in convincingly authoritative tone and delicling his adversary's political pretensions and generally threatened treating him with such marked condensation that many of Lincoln's friends watching his dark, homely, careworn face are his dark face, his dark, his dark complexion, homely, careworn face began to fear that he had displayed more courage than wisdom in courting comparison with so brilliant a rival. And we're on page 331 of this same book. And again, we're going to get another source saying the same thing says Lincoln's own life story. And again, it's the same autobiography where he says, if any personal description of me is thought desirable, it may be said I am in height six feet, four inches, nearly lean in flesh, weighing on average 180 pounds, dark complexion. Again, dark complexion. All right. So when they're saying his dark, homely face, they know what they're saying. They don't mean like a dark face that he's looking dark, like sad or, or like evil. No, he's dark complexion with coarse black hair and gray eyes. That's from his own words. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. We're on page 573 of the same book. All right. And down here it says, is this bo bloody war ever to end? This says, the morning after the bloody battle of the wilderness, I saw him walk up and down the executive chamber. His long arms behind his back. His dark features, again, his dark features contrasted, contracted still more with gloom. As he looked up, I thought his face the saddest one I ever had seen, he exclaimed. And continue page 579 in the same book. 579 it says the president in the streets of the Capitol. And it says right here, I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face. With the deep cut lines, the eyes always look to me with a deep Latin sadness in the expression. Again, Abraham Lincoln, dark brown face, dark brown face. Who is dark brown? Dark brown face. Again, look at this image. I'm telling you right now, people, does this look like a dark brown face to you? Is this a dark complexion face to you? Is this dark features? dark brown all right same book page 618 chapter 23 says the end of the war after the inaugurate negro ceremonies it says here he was in his plain two horse barouche and looked very much worn and tired the lines indeed of vast responsibilities intricate questions and demands of life and death cut deeper than even upon his dark brown face again his dark brown face Yet all the old goodness and tenderness, sadness and canny shrewdness underneath the furrows. All right, we're in the book, The Hitting Lincoln, from the letters and papers of William H. Herndon. We're on page 184 of this book. And it says there's a letter here from June 24, 1887. Mr. Bartlett, my dear sir. Right, they're writing to that person. And it seems by your friend, W.H. Henderson. Right, and he's writing about what Mr. Uh, Lincoln looks like, says, you speak of Mr. Lincoln's fine physical nature, but to see and study the man, you would say that Mr. Lincoln's physical nature was comparatively low, coarse, and not fine and high. He seemed to have no blood in his frame. His flesh was dark. His flesh, his flesh was dark, darkness. All right, all this dark, where's the pale? Again, they keep showing us these white pictures of Abraham Lincoln growing up. Every time we Google Lincoln, every time we try to look for him, they, even in these books that are describing him as dark complexion, they keep putting a white pale face, a pale face Lincoln in the cover of the book, even though they're writing his flesh was dark. In the same book on page 361, down here says Josh C. Richardson's statement from, uh, it says here, my father came to Spencer County, Indiana, 1828. It says Lincoln was tall, a raw boned at 18, when 16 years of age, he was six feet high. He was so tall, right? He was somewhat bony and raw, dark skinned, dark skinned. What does this mean? Oh, Pacuri Mayo, that means pale. No, dark skinned. Why do they keep showing us pale face images of Abraham Lincoln 
and we're getting only accounts of him being dark skinned from everybody dark skinned dark complexion dark features dark face bronze dark brown face dark brown complexion dark skin on page 412 we get down here Lincoln the individual and they start describing him let's see what he says says he it is now the time to describe the person mr. Lincoln he was about six feet four inches high and when he left the city was 51 years old having good health and no gray hairs or but few on his head he was thin wary sinewy sinewy I don't know how to say that raw and big heavy boned thin through the breast to the back and narrow across the shoulders standing he leaned forward and was what may be called stooped shouldered inclining to the consumptively built his usual weight being about 160 or 80 pounds his organization rather his structure and functions worked slowly his blood had to run a long distance from his heart to the extremities of his frame he was so long right his bones were long he was tall and his nerve force had to travel through dry ground a long distance before his muscles were obedient to his will his organisms and structure were loose and leathery. His body was well shrunk, cadaverous, and shriveled, having very dark skin. Very dark skin. We're adding an adjective to this. We're not just saying he's dark skin. He's very dark skin. We're not talking about a tan. We're not talking about some pale-faced dude who might have look a little Semitic. No, he is very dark skin. They're describing the individual. They told you in the beginning of this. Say, let's now let's get to his character he is very uh, dark skin dry and tough wrinkled in line somewhat in flabby folds dark hair the man looking woe struck the whole man body and mind worked slowly creakingly and as if needed oiling it's called the life of abraham lincoln drawn from original sources and containing many speeches letters and telegrams hitherto unpublished by ida m tarbell volume one this is from 1900 on page 360 of this book, it says they noted his great height, his huge hands and feet, his peculiar lankness of limb, his shoulders drooped as he stood, giving his form a look of irresolution, his smooth shaven face seemed of bronze as he listened to their message and amazed them by its ruggedness. The cheeks were sunken, the cheekbones high, the nose large, the mouth un unsymmetrical, the underlip protruding a little, alright? So he's what his face is what bronze a bronze face bronze it says here the lincoln encyclopedia all right this is the lincoln encyclopedia the spoken and written words of abraham lincoln from his own words people all right an encyclopedia of his own words arranged for ready reference compiled and edited by archer h shaw with introduction by david c Mearns, assistant librarian from the library of congress this is from 1950 and we're on page 190 of this book of this encyclopedia right all right so we're zoomed in to page 190 and it says here the personal description of abraham lincoln his own personal descriptions right we're an encyclopedia library of congress pay attention people it says perhaps you have forgotten me don't you remember a long black fellow a long black fellow black fellow who rode on horseback with you from tremont to springfield nearly 10 years ago swimming our horses over the machina on the trip well i am that same old fellow all right so that was abraham lincoln writing to somebody to josephus hewitt on february 13th 1848 saying do you remember man i'm the black dude i'm the black fellow got another one here again we have this already just want to verify we got it from a different source and a verifiable source right it says if any personal description of me is thought desirable it may be said that i am in height six feet four inches nearly lean in flesh weighing an average 180 pounds dark complexion all right again dark complexion with coarse black hair and dark eyes no other marks or brands recollected remember what that meant that meant he was making fun that he used to be a slave and he ran away this is the uh, american orator's own book of the art extemporaneous public speaking including a course of discipline for obtaining the faculties of discrimination arrangement and oral discussion with the debate and exercise and argument of declamation and numerous selections for practice blah 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 La. James K. John and Brother, 1836. Chief Justice 
uh, Marshall, I believe it's John Marshall. We'll get to his name. The Chief Justice, person of Marshall, because they're describing all these important people, right? Now it says here, the Chief Justice of the United States is in his person tall, meager, em emaciated, his muscles relaxed, and his joints so loosely connected as not only to disqualify him, apparently, for any vigorous exertions of body, but to destroy everything like elegance and a harmony in his air and movements. Indeed, in his whole appearance and demeanor, dress, attitude, and gestures, sitting, standing, and walking, he is as far removed from the idolized graces of Lord Chesterfield as any other gentleman on earth. To continue the portrait, his head and face are small in proportion to his height. His complexion is swarthy. All right, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the, of the United States. We're gonna, I'm going to show you who he is, what Wikipedia shows us, right? But this is a primary source. Again, this is a primary source describing him. His complexion is swarthy. Swarthy means black. There's no going around that. That's black. Dark skin. The muscles of his face being relaxed. All right. So it continues with him. Who is John Marshall? We got another body snatcher here, guys. John Marshall. It says here was an American politician and lawyer and served as the Chief Justice of the United States from 1801 to 1835. Marshall remains the longest serving Chief Justice, fourth longest serving Justice. All right. So he was under Adams. All right. He was the Marshal served as the United States Secretary of State under John Adams. All right. Under John Adams. Let's go to the picture. All right. Now I'm asking you, does this guy look like a swarthy guy to you? I don't see anywhere where they would say that or mistake him for being swarthy. <laughs> because in reality, his complexion is swarthy. Do I have to remind everybody what swarthy means? Nothing like that. I wanted people to see the hijack. Not even close, remember. And these are descendants of Europeans, right? A chronicle of the Supreme Court, Edward Samuel Corwin. All right. And again... His head and face are small in proportion inside his complexion, swarthy, swarthy, just to confirm, just to make sure that wasn't just a typo in that other book. Thomas Hickey from Wethersfield Historical Society. All right. All right. So it says, oh, and six, he was a dark complexion Irishman, by the way. I'm finding these continual references to Hickey's swarthy complexion amongst amusing it seems to be a piece of information that could only be provided by someone who actually had known Hickey, a primary source, or at least had seen him, had seen him. But nowhere in my research did I come across any such firsthand observations. So this book is Washington by Ron Chernoff, a very famous historian and publisher of books of uh, American history. He actually wrote a lot on uh, Alexander Hamilton. Now, let's see what he says of Thomas Hickey. Hickey it says how Thomas Hickey and Michael Lynch also detained on counterfeiting charges as being in league with the British to sabotage the Continental Army as a defendant New York. In their wild boats, and the two men had contended that when British warships anchored in the harbor, William Tryon, the royal governor, would distribute royal pardons to defectors. It says Matthew's name, Thomas Hickey, a swarthy, brazen fellow. Thomas Hickey is a swarthy, brazen fellow. Matthew named him Thomas Hick, a swarthy, brazen fellow. Swarthy. Oh, now we got Samuel Francois. I knew I was going to find this guy. Uh-oh. Right. Francois. Francois. Let me see. Samuel Francois. So they got this image of him right, right here. A sketch, supposedly, from the 1900s, right? So that's not even near his time. Because he's from 1700s. It says that Samuel Francis was an American restaurateur and the owner-operator of Francis Tavern in New York City during the Revolutionary War. He provided for prisoners held during seven-year British occupation of New York and claimed to have been a spy for the American side. He was a spy. At the end of the war, it was at Francis Tavern that General George Washington said farewell to his officers. Francis later served as steward of Washington's presidential household in New York City and Philadelphia. So he knew him personally. All right. Samuel Francois. Samuel Francois. Hold up, Samuel Francois. 
just want to show you the title of the book. It says Key Leaders in Colonial New York. And it has an Iroquois chief right here. Elizabeth O'Grady and Colleen Adams. All right. And who's this swarthy fellow right here? All right. So this book is by uh, Elizabeth O'Grady and Colleen Adams. Not all African men dodge the hijack. A lot of all this African stuff, right? Not all so-called colored men, not all colored men and women in the colony of New York were slaves. Samuel Francois. Samuel Francois is believed to have been a free black man. He turned an old home in New York City into a tavern in 1762. In the early 1770s, Patriot leader wanted the colonists to fight for freedom from British rule. They met at Francis Tavern to discuss plans that led to the American Revolution. All right. This is a picture of Samuel Francois, the owner of Francis Tavern. The tavern was melting place for important leaders of the time in New York. All right. This is his drawing of the picture. All right. And like, like, so what? So see this depiction they got here? Because you know what it is? I'm showing you guys this is because his complexion is debated today. His complexion is debated today. And it's silly. It's really silly. Right, this is the president's kitchen cabinet, the story of the African Americans, right? Dodge the hijack again by Adrian Miller. It says art okay, it says some historians have strongly argued that Francis was white. Alright, does this guy look like a white person to you? Alright, and yeah, he owned a business in the 1700s, imagine. So it says some historians they're gonna argue that Francis was white, and why would they wanna argue that? If he's clearly a, a so-called black man. Because they want to hide something. I know they're trying to hide it. And I bet you if you follow this guy's ancestry, it's going to lead to Europe. It's not going to, or maybe even an Indian. In the West Indies, because mm -hmm. he came from the West Indies in Haiti. This guy came from Haiti. All right. It says here that some historians, again, strongly argue that Francis was white and his painted portrait, he looks white. And while this is not dispositive of African heritage, dodge the hijack again, the images raises doubts. We know that Francis hailed from the West Indies, probably from Jamaica or Saint Domingue, so they don't really know present-day Haiti. But again, the fact in and of itself is not determinative of his race. Ale okay, so listen to this: Alexander Hamilton, a well-known Caucasian. Oh, we're gonna debunk this one. All right, so dodge the hijack big time here. The funny thing is that in this book. They're not even arguing that he's white. They clearly know. They're even saying he's a free black man. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this other book, they're, they're debating it. <laughs> Supposedly. The second reason a darker skin tone hasn't always led to the assumption that one had African ancestry. There are whites who have been described as having swarthy complexion without any further speculation about their race. He's talking about all these things that we've been reading. Now, he's saying there's white people being described as what a swarthy because according to this guy's hijack, all people that come in from Europe are white. So they're even describing white people as swarthy. No, because they're black. They're not white. Uh, Alan Miller, nice. Adrian Miller. They're not white, Adrian Miller. You're trying to, you're trying to add some hijack here, Adrian Miller. It says other repute, reputable class publications and contemporaneous media accounts also describe Frances as a mulatto, the term of that time for biracial people. Oh, really? Frances biographer Charles Bloxon adds, while researching the story of his life, it was discovered that Frances' racial identity was recorded as Negro, not African, colored, not African, Haitian Negro, again, not African, and mulatto, again, not African. That's what his contemporary records say. Fastidious old Negro, another one says, and Swarty. And he's got the, he's even got the, the footnote so you can go look for the source, even though he's adding hijack. All right. Washington, a life by Ron Chernoff. Ron Chernoff got the drop. When it came to time for Washington to bid farewell to his officers, Francis Tavern seemed like the ideal spot. The innkeeper Samuel Francis was a West Indian called Black Sam. He was Black Sam. His nickname probably refers to swarthy complexion rather than African parentage, rather than oh, African, rather than African. He was swarthy complexion, not because of his African parentage. Okay. All right. You listen. I know you're there still in the chat listening. You're learning. An excellent cook and a Freemason. 
Oh, an excellent cook and what? Freemason. Francoise was partial to wigs and fancy clothing and had rather aristocratic air. A secret friend to the American cause during the war, he helped helped to relieve the agony of American prisoners held in New York and also worked to thwart a plot to assassinate Washington. Congress would later repay him handsomely by housing and government offices in Francois' tavern. Well aware of his heroism, Washington wrote to Francis warmly that some, summer and thanked him for constant friendship and attention to cause for our country. All oh, his Freemasonic buddy. Mm-hmm. The swarthy West Indian Freemason who owned a shop in New York. I'm going to submit to this guy, right? According to White Wiki hand, this is Samuel Francois, right? Touch the hijack. We already know this is a body snatcher. This, he's a Negro. It's not nothing. This guy is not Francois. Stop lying. Yes, they just drew this the other day. You know why I know? Because look at right here, all the way to the left. Check it Thomas out. Thomas Hickey. We already got Thomas Hickey earlier. Remember? Oh, he was snap. smarty. <clears throat> look, they're using the same person. This is Wikipedia now. Wiki Hand and Wikipedia. They're using the same person for two swarthy Europeans. Thomas Hickey, Wikipedia. Samuel Francois, Wiki Hand. We caught him in the act. We caught him in the act. Mm. Okay? They can't try to hide this. They're going to hide this tomorrow. They're going to switch it up tomorrow for anybody who didn't see the video. Yeah. Info again, this is the scrapbook from 1908. And this is page 316. And it's talking about John Randolph. Who's John Randolph? Well, John Randolph is the celebrated Randolph of Roanoke. He was the most famous descendant from the marriage of John Rolfe and Pocahontas. He's the son of Pocahontas. Now, look at this guy right here. Right? (laughs) This is what they're saying, John. Remember, Pocahontas, right? Remember earlier what they were saying? As dark and swarthy as an Indian. Right? So, okay, where's his... At least, at least something. Where's this mixture? If anything, if any, right? Like it says, it is well known that some of the oldest and most notable families in Virginia are descended from the marriage of John Rolfe with the Indian princess Pocahontas. Descent from Pocahontas indeed is regarded as an honor. The most famous of her line was the celebrated John Randolph of Roanoke, who had indeed characteristics that were more Indian than Caucasian. He was more Indian than Caucasian. Look at him right here. <laughs> <laughs> really? So who's this guy you're showing here if he's more Indian than Caucasian? Well, what does it say here? It says, he was swarthy of complexion and fierce and untamable in all his ways, fond of dueling, noted for his bitter tongue, and feared amongst as much of by his friends as his enemies. He lived almost as a hermit at home that took an active part in politics. When he was in the United States Senator, he used to stride into Senate into the costume of a hunter. You hear what is going on? This guy was dressed, not this guy, not this fake guy, but John <laughs> Randolph, the real John Randolph, the swarthy complexion son of Pocahontas he was a senator did you know that and he was a swarthy guy who was a black man right because John Rolfe was probably a black man too he might be swarthy European too again he was swarthy when he went into the senate what did he do he put on a custom and says no he didn't put on a custom he put on his traditional clothes from his mom of a hunter he went in there like an Indian hunter and with two huge dogs of his heels. He had his two shalots with him. Mm. He was like, damn, boys, don't kill yet. Only when I tell chill, you. It was chill. Chill. <laughs> chill, killer. Get him, killer. <laughs> All right. He was, by the way, the inventor of the expressive term dough face. Oh, dough boy, dough face. That was him. He made that up. All right. <laughs> That's him, all right? The Swarty John. The Swarty, the real one. The Swarty John Randolph. Not this guy right here. Yeah, we all know Doughboy was uh, Swarty. <laughs> we know Doughboy was Swarty. You don't try to play us with your with your part alfalfa hairdo. No. So we got this book here, The Guns of Independence, The Siege of Georgetown, 1781 by Jerome Green. And they're talking about this guy, this Colonel Tar- Tarleton. Colonel Tarleton. His full name is Banastre Tarleton. All right. He says, was the most hated enemy soldier operating in the colonies. This 27 year old native of Liverpool, a native of what? Liverpool. He was from England, Liverpool, hailed from the upper middle class and studied law at the universities of Liverpool and Oxford. 
He was in the Dragoon Guards. All right. We're going to get to this part right here where it's describing him. It says, although he denied the report, there is little doubt atrocities occurred. Dashing in manner and boasting a swarthy complexion, Tarleton was also possessed of a terrible temper and impetuousness that resulted in his sharp defeat of the Battle of Coens in January 1781. So he was swarthy complexion. And then we got uh, this book, George Washington it says Ultimate Collection, Military Journals, Rules of Civility by George Washington, Washington Irving, blah, 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 by himself, George Washington himself, right? Talking about Lieutenant Colonel Banastri Tarleton, this bold dragoon with parentheses, there you go, so noted in Southern warfare, was about 26 years of age, of a swarthy complexion, all right? From primary sources, swarthy complexion with small black piercing eyes. Remember, he was from Liverpool. He was from England with a swarthy complexion. All right, so you guys ready to see Born a Born? A, what is it, tar Tarleton? All right, man, don't be disappointed. Don't be disappointed. All right, Wikipedia did it to us again. But Nostra Tarleton, we got another body snatcher here, guys. The body snatchers. I should have known better. You can't fool me twice again, because I know Tarleton from primary sources. Uh, George Washington himself is saying he's swarthy complexion. He's a swarthy complexion guy. He doesn't look like this guy. There you go, swarthy. That's not swarthy to me. All right, break the spell. So swarthy, Tarleton. We got another body snatcher. All right, note that. Did you guys keep keeping notes? All right. And what's this right here? We got The Life of George Washington, Volumes 3 and 4. This is an older book, 1800s. And we got, again, Colonel Barnastri Tarleton, who commanded them, was one of the dogs of war, which Sir Henry was prepared to let slip on emergencies to score in Moray, the county. This bold dragoon, so noted in Southern warfare, was about 26 years of age, of a swarthy complexion. Swarthy complexion. All right, Swarty. You good? Sex and Race and Volume Two: Negro Caucasian Mix in All Ages. Sex and Race, Volume Two by J. A. Rogers. Really good book. Uh, they're talking about here a Daniel Webster. All right, a Daniel Webster. It says he was so dark that it seems among Negroes he would be easily be taken for one. He was known as Black Dan. He was known as Black Dan, and amongst Negroes he would have been taken for one. Black Dan. Few says so swarthy was his complexion that the Deweys took him for an Indian. <laughs> Again, he was so swarthy they took him for an Indian. So swarthy. Right. So General John Stark referring to Daniel's Moorish complexion, right? Moorish complexion, meaning Negro complexion, said it was oh. like that of Ebenezer Webster's, who's also obviously Moorish complexion, which burnt gunpowder could not change. Webster's himself said that one of the, his ancestors, Stephen Bachelor, had a very swarthy skin and black coarse hair. All right. As regards the statement that if Daniel Webster had been seen in a colored audience, he would have been taken for colored. We have the following from General Butler, who wrote that Secretary of War Stanton from Louisiana regarding a regiment of Negroes. He was enlisted for service in the Union Army. I shall have within a few days a regiment of Native Guards colored, the darkest of whom will be about the complexion of the late Mr. Webster. Uh, as black as Mr. Webster. All right, so we got another body snatcher, right? Daniel Webster, right? He was so swarthy, like coal. Oh, let's go back. Like Ebenezer Webster, which burnt gunpowder, like gunpowder could not change. Webster himself said that one of his ancestors, Stephen Bachelor, had a very swarthy skin, black horse hair. So let me see who Daniel Webster is. We still got a body snatcher here. He was an American lawyer and statesman who represented New Hampshire and Massachusetts in the Congress, served as the U.S. Secretary of State under President William Henry Harrison. All right. That's who Daniel Webster is. Daniel Webster, again, was so dark that it seems among Negroes, he would have easily been taken for one. Let me see here. Saratoga, Turning Point of America's Revolutionary War by Richard M. Ketchum. Ketchum says in seconding the 48-year-old William Howie to Boston. In 1775, George III may have hoped that some magic still attached to the Howie name. The general's brother, George Augustus, 
III, Viscount Howie, had been extremely popular in the colonies, and his death in the 1758 attack on Fort Ticonderoga was generally mourned by the New Englanders who served with him, who placed a monument to him in Westminster Abbey. William Howie was a kinsman after a fashion to George III. Since one of his grandmothers had been the mistress of the king's great-grandfather, he was burly and coarse-looking, a six-footer with, with terrible teeth and the same swarthy complexion that led sailors to call his brother Richard Black Dick. Oh man, oh man. So swarthy complexion, right? So both these brothers are swarthy complexion. All right, you guys ready again? George Howie the Third, Viscount Howie. Here we go. See that? He took his swarthiness right off. I mean, come on, man. Like, look at he's like Casper. It's like he looks like he's dying. Like, is this a vampire? What's going on here? This is like the total opposite of Swarty. Yeah. Again, he's Swarty complexion, just like his brother, Black Dick. Richard, yeah. Swarty complexion. <laughs> All right? Damn. Right. Body snatchers. <laughs> so that was uh, George III again. And again, a lot of these people can be described in numerous writings as Swarty. I just picked some of them, like... And we got Jonathan Alder. Who's Jonathan Alder? It says Jonathan Alder was an American pioneer and the first white settler. All right, listen to this. If you're from Ohio. So Jonathan Alder was supposed to be the very first white settler in Madison County, Ohio. As a young child living in Virginia, Alder was kidnapped by Shawnee Indians and later adopted by a Mingo chief in the Ohio country. He lived with the Native Americans for many years before returning to the white community. It says, History of Jonathan Alder. His Captivity and Life with the Indians by Henry Clay Alder. All right. An Alder, a descendant, most likely of his. Transcribed and with a foreword by Doyle H. Davison. Compiled and noted edited with introduction by Larry L. Nielsen, the University of Akron Press. Jonathan Alder that emerges from his narrative has was honest, caring, and genuinely concerned that both his Indian and white neighbors resolve their differences fairly and honorably. Bears describes Alder as a little over six feet in height, he was very tall, or well, you know, and straight as an arrow, and adds that his hair and eyebrows were black as coal, his complexion dark and swarthy. All right, he was dark and swarthy again, twice. Dark and swarthy, his face large and well formed, denoting strength of character and firmness of purpose. His eyes were bright and piercing, while his whole appearance, gait, and actions were characterized of the Indians. All right, swarthy, complexion dark, John Elder, who was kidnapped supposedly by the Shawnee and lived with the Indians. All right, and the first so called first white settler. How is he white if he's dark and swarthy? See the hijack. How's he the first white settler? You mean the first European that arrived to Madison County, Ohio? The first European who arrived there was a black man, a black European. He was black, black. And again, this is from the history of Madison County, Ohio. This is from 1883 by Robert C. Brown. And it's talking about John Alder's names appears among the first jurors of the Madison County so that he early began to be a useful citizen. He became comfortably well off in the world's goods, although not rich by any means. In personal appearance, he says, when he's speaking of the meeting between himself and his brother and mother, I was a little over six feet in height and as straight as an arrow ever it was. His hair and eyebrows were as black as coal, his complexion dark and swarthy. The history of Madison County, see, right? His own words. All right, he's dark and swarthy. He was a European. They're calling him white. Remember, they call him white. He's a European, but he's a black man, so-called black man. And this is the uh, Cleveland State University Early History of Cleveland, Ohio, by Charles Witt Tulsi from 2015. And again, his complexion was so swarthy. They're talking about John Elder. He was so swarthy. So swarthy. He was so swarthy. Man, he's so swarthy. It's like it's like saying, like, what did they say? Like, so dark. Man, he was so his complexion was so dark, so black. 
what do they mean? <laughs> they're, he's he's expressing, yeah, he's expressing how swarthy he was, right? His complexion was so swarthy. This first so-called white man, right? He was so swarthy, though. His figure so square and stout. His dress so rude that the Indians supposed some of the blood of their race had crept into his veins because he was what? So swarthy. He must be one of us, too. He looks like us because he's so swarthy. Says the attack on Logan Station, 1777. And we got this James Harrod was a man of valor. At 16 years of age, he was a young soldier in the French and Indian War. He loved the scout trail and grew up to be one of the best sign readers among all the long hunters of Kentucky. He was a tall, silent, swarthy. He was swarthy, as dark as the Indians who tracked. What? James Harrod was as dark as the Indians whom he tracked. He was swarthy like the Indians, so the Indians are swarthy. Thank you for letting us know. All right, so James Harrod was swarthy as dark as an Indian, right? We're about to go to James Harrod right now. You guys ready? All right. So we got James Harrod right here, right? All right, James Harrod, frontiersman, founder of the Harrisburg, Kentucky. His first permanent settlement was of the Alleghenies. Now, I'm going to ask you. Because you're an Indian, right? Uh, uh, you're watching me, right? Are you... <laughs> is this guy as swarthy as you? <laughs> uh, no. As dark as you? <laughs> okay, so who's this... Bodies and Who's this imposter right here, man? Who's these actors? And I imagine all these frontier men you're going to start seeing, they were really all dark-skinned. Most of them. They knew how to survive in the frontier. That's why a lot of times I'll be like, so how did these Europeans learn how to just all of a sudden become trackers and become ill in the forest with the Indians and stuff? Well, maybe they have that in their blood. All right. James Harrod, you ain't as dark as no Indian. What are you talking about, man? Yo, what you do with the James, the real James Harrod? All right. What is this book in archive.org? Hold on. Let me get the cover. I like reading the cover. But I'm going to show you what they got. And their cover as the Indians. I know some of you saw it already. The Great West. Look at the Indians. Swarthy. Swarthy. So that, okay, let's go. Hold up. James Harrod. Okay, let's compare. James Harrod is supposedly swarthy as dark as the Indians he tracked. Do you see that? Again, that was the cover of the book of the Great West. All right, so we got what do we got here? Because we already know James Harrod. Yeah, that's not him. Let's let's let's. He's, he's gone. He's gone. Yeah, he's swarthy. We already know that. So we got Lewis Wetzel. Wetzel. Lewis Wetzel was perhaps the most indefatigable Indian hunter on the frontiers. All right, he was an Indian hunter hunting your ancestors. All right, during the wars, it is said that disguised as an Indian, he disguised himself as an Indian. Now, can a white person disguise himself as you? Just think about it. Just think about it. It says he killed in the region of the Upper Ohio alone 27 of the enemy. He killed 27 Indians and they boast about it. Beside a number more of the Kentucky frontier, his person was in keeping with his character. He was about five feet, nine inches and in height, very broad shouldered and full breasted. His complexion was dark and swarthy. Not only just swarthy, it was dark and swarthy as an indians now you know they know what an indian looks like right why why do we know that they know what an indian looks like in this book from 1859 all right i didn't tell you that i've been reading a lot of old books 1859 right they know right we got the lady laughing in the background she's like you guys didn't know this this song's called the joker's lair <laughs> The jokes on us. Exactly. See, they know what an Indian looks like because they got him in the cover, right? So when they're saying that this guy, who's an Indian hunter, looks like them, right? His complexion was dark and swarthy, as in Indians, and his face pitted with smallpox. All right. So is he not a Moor? Can I be real with the real Moors out there? Is he not a Moor? Uh, if, his complexion, if his complexion was dark and swarthy because what I'm trying to say is real history we can't overlook this this was a dark skinned very dark skinned man 
hunting and you're trying to blame the white man for always. This is heritagehistory.com, the scrape of the Wetzel brothers. Oh, the Wetzel brothers. Uh -oh. The Wetzel brothers, yeah. Lewis was now 23, a border man through and through, and skilled almost beyond all others. He was not of the long type. Instead, he was five feet, eight inches, darker in complexion than his swarthy brothers. Lewis and the Wetzel brothers, there's a whole crew of Wetzel Indian hunters, of black men, black Wetzel men, black uh, Europeans. So his brothers were even darker than him. There's a bunch of them wandering around killing Indians. All the brothers had long hair, black and old and curled, curled hair. They all had curled hair. His was the longest. When not lose, it formed a bunch under his fur cap. Okay, so it says memorial addresses on the life and character of John Alexander Logan. This is from an older book, 1800s, United States Congress. It is said that poets are born, not made. So it is maybe truly said that General Logan was a natural soldier. Every instinct within him has inspired with fervent love of his country. His figure was massive, his shoulders broad, his presence commanded. With his swarthy face and coal black hair and eyes like Mars to threaten or command red eyes, hmm, he was very inch a warrior. The soldiers of the late war believed in him as leader in the field, and those of that great Union army who survived him mourn his loss today as their nearest, most earnest, able, and most devoted friend. So, again, this John. A. Logan, Alexander Logan is swarthy. All right. Now, when I Googled him, right, when you go to Jane, Joan A. Logan, right, this is what they show. <laughs> Joan A. Logan, swarthy. How do they get swarthy from this? Because if he's swarthy, this dude don't look nothing swarthy to me. Look at, look at him here. Like, there's nothing swarthy about him. Not even close. All right, and we're in the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Encyclopedia Britannica online, Britannica.com. All right, what is it telling us? Logan, nicknamed Blackjack. He was called Blackjack. Blackjack. Hold up, where he at? Yo, Blackjack. Where you at, Blackjack? Yo, Blackjack. This guy right here was called Blackjack. <laughs> this is Blackjack, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, for his swarthy complexion. He's called Blackjack because of his swarthy complexion. Am I the only one that's confused here? All right. Blackjack for his swarthy complexion and jet black hair. Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> 